On March 22, 1993, four teenagers died during a school trip. 31 years ago, Sylvia and Noel Dunn were at home watching the news. The activity centre where they had sent their oldest son on a school trip suddenly became the headline news. Their son, Simon, was supposed to be having a great time at St Albans Centre, an adventure holiday camp in Lyme Regis. However, Simon and three of his friends did not return home. Sensing that something was seriously wrong, Sylvia and Noel were told to go to Southway Community College, where their 16-year-old son was in sixth form. When Simon's name was called out in the school hall, Sylvia was taken to another room. It was there that she learned the heartbreaking news that Simon had drowned during a canoe trip. At the same time, Noel, who had gone home to check the answering machine for updates, saw a police car pulling up outside their home. Given his experience in the police force, he knew that this could only mean one thing. His son was no longer alive. The couple's lives plunged into darkness and chaos ensued. They were driven by an officer to a hospital over 70 miles away, where chaos unfolded as press reporters gathered outside, eager for updates on the tragic events that not only shook Plymouth, but the entire country. To avoid intrusion, Sylvia and Noel were guided through the back entrance. When the commotion settled, Noel turned to the officer who had driven them and inquired about the number of students who had lost their lives. Recalling the events 31 years later, Noel said, I asked if other children were involved and he replied, I can't tell you, Noel. I pressed on asking, how many more? One, two, three? When I reached four, he said, I didn't tell you that. Later, it was revealed that Dean Sayer age 17, and 16-year-olds Claire Langley and Rachel Walker also perished in the disaster. While pupils Emma Hartley, Joanna Willis, Samantha Stansby, and Marie Rendell, along with teacher Norman Pointer and instructors Karen Gardner and Anthony Mann were rescued, Simon, Dean, Claire, and Rachel were swept away. Rachel would have celebrated her 17th birthday just two days later. Survivors later shared that Simon used humour and songs to lift spirits during the struggle to stay alive. Known for his prankster nature and wicked sense of humour, Simon led others in singing a chorus of eight red canoes sinking in the water to the tune of ten green bottles as they waited for rescue. However, reality struck for Sylvia and Noel when they found themselves in the same room as their deceased son just hours later. Initially, thinking it was a tragic accident, it became clear in the following months that the true events of that day were far from accidental. It was corporate manslaughter, and the owner of the company would face imprisonment. In the year 2018, Sylvia and Noel relocated to Buckland Monocorum. Their two younger children are now grown, and between them, they have six children. Despite the passage of time, they carry the enduring pain of losing Simon in an unjust, tragic and preventable situation. While speaking in the year 2018, Sylvia remarked, It's been years, and a lot has happened in that time. But when I think of Simon, it feels like no time has passed. I can't believe it's been 25 years because the pain is still raw. Recalling the moment they were told about Simon's death, she described entering a state of darkness and overwhelming noise. It was horrible. You just zone into this horrible blackness and horrible noise, and I realized it was me making it. It was awful. Your worst nightmare. I can remember everything from that day, minute to minute, but the two weeks after, I remember nothing. It's just blank. Over the years, the darkness has faded, and Sylvia and Noel now live by Simon's own words. He had visited neighbours who had lost a child before he went away and questioned why they were always sad and negative. Sylvia remembered their conversation. I don't know what it is like to lose a child, she had told him, to which he responded, their son wouldn't want them to be like that. Life is too short. Life is for living. These words serve as a guiding light for Sylvia and Noel during tough times. Sylvia emphasised, when I'm down, We've got to get on for him. It's so amazing that he said that before he went away. Amid their grief, they find strength in Simon's philosophy and strive to live their lives in a way that honours his memory. Be sure to give this video a like if you are enjoying the content. 
Simon's death brought about significant changes, particularly in the form of specific legislation aimed at preventing similar tragedies. Noel expressed, after it happened and they died, we got a lot of attention. We couldn't go shopping without being recognized, but the most crucial aspect was getting the act in place. So hopefully it will never happen again. Reflecting on the past, Noel highlighted the lax regulations that allowed individuals with just a few thousand pounds and an interest in outdoor activities to set up activity centers without any qualifications. He emphasized, you didn't need any qualifications to open an activity center, you just opened it. But as time went on, there were incidents where children died. What brought it home to us was when Simon went away to what we thought was a safe place, a safe environment, and it wasn't. The trial that followed Simon's death brought the issue into the public eye, revealing a shocking lack of qualified personnel overseeing such activities. Noel noted, people were shocked to find out there was such a lack of people qualified to take people out. The people that took our kids out were one star, instructors, which wasn't much better than the children themselves. Noel stressed the importance of allowing children to engage in activities while acknowledging the need for proper safety measures. He recalled a conversation with his daughter, who sought advice when her daughter wanted to go on an activity week. Noel's response was clear. She goes, you can't wrap kids in cotton wool. You've got to let them get out and do things. The tragic events on March 22, 1993, sent shockwaves across the UK. Despite favorable weather conditions, the circumstances quickly turned dire during the school trip. Teacher Norman Pointer experienced difficulties and student Dean Sayer capsized dangerously close to the shore. The trial that ensued shed light on the inadequate qualifications of those responsible for the student's safety, prompting a necessary re-evaluation of regulations to prevent future tragedies. Be sure to give this video a like if you are enjoying the content. Okay, so Dean thought he could go back when the instructor, Tony Mann, asked. But as they tried to help the teacher, they saw the others were gone. Within 20 minutes, most canoes sank and the pupils clung to the last one in freezing seas. The center's handyman was supposed to meet them, but by 12.25 p.m., he reported the children missing. A fishing boat found a kayak and the skipper called for help, marking the start of a tragedy. Seven minutes before that call, the last canoe sank, leaving the children helpless. Mr. Stoddart searched for them, and students Samantha and Emma swam for help. Some became unconscious from cold and exhaustion, far from where they were supposed to be. June Moforth, the school's acting head teacher, got a call at 6 p.m. Teacher John Ellis mentioned a problem, but said the pupils were getting picked up by helicopter. Minutes later, she learned one child had died. Back at the school, they had a list of eight canoeists, not knowing who died. After 9 p.m., they confirmed Simon Dunn's death and three critical conditions. Mrs. Moforth informed parents of the sixth form tutors. Two hours later, a fax with the list of the dead arrived. After a sleepless night, Mrs. Moforth told the staff at 7 a.m. and spoke to the pupils in assemblies. There were three gaps in the A-level English class, Something everyone found hard to come to terms with, she said after the tragedy. After the tragedy, the manager of the activity center was jailed and a law was passed to hold companies criminally responsible for similar deaths. Parents, with the support of then Devonport MP David Jameson, played a vital role in passing the 1995 activity center's Young Persons Safety Law. The Corporate Manslaughter Act 2007 made it easier to convict irresponsible companies and it came into force on April 6, 2008. David Jameson, reflecting on the events 20 years later, emphasized the parents' commitment to preventing future tragedies. He highlighted the impact of Lime Bay on the city and the country, with the tragedy narrowly avoiding even greater loss of life due to a matter of minutes and small safety oversights. In the aftermath, St Albans Centre's parent company OLL, was prosecuted, and the activity centre manager, Peter Kite, was jailed for three years in 1994, but released after 14 months. 
the Devon County Council's report stated that the tragedy simply should not have happened. There were concerns about the law being abolished in 2011, but David Jameson warned against such a move, stressing the importance of regulations for children's safety in activities. He expressed worries about potential dangers if safety checks were neglected, emphasising the positive aspects of activities for youngsters' team building and character development. The tragic events in Lime Bay on that fateful day in 1993 resulted in a thorough breakdown of the timeline, highlighting the failure to arrive at the intended destination, the search and rescue operations, and the eventual discovery of the survivors and those who did not make it. And with that, we conclude our journey through the tragic events of Lime Bay in 1993. If you've been moved by this story and believe in the importance of safety measures, consider sharing this video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, leave a comment, and hit the notification bell for more content. Our thoughts are with those affected, and let's stand together in advocating for the safety and well-being of our youth.